Hey, everybody, this is Mike with the One Stop Co-op Shop and MVP Board Games, and I'm super excited to uh, be able to show you the first glimpse of uh, the next game that Peter and I have designed, Flame and Fang, which is a one to four player a cooperative adventure game. And it's coming to Kickstarter in early October, and I'm going to do a five point, uh, not review, because clearly it's my game and I'm a little bit biased, but I wanted to tell you uh, five cool things about the game that I think you might enjoy. So let's get into it, and if you think the game looks cool, uh, click the link in the video description or in the pinned comment to uh, follow the Kickstarter page. Hope you enjoy it! So the number five thing I'd like to highlight about Flame and Fang is that there's a lot of variety in how the chapters play out and how you can modify things to your group's needs and likings. So it's an eight chapter campaign. And I think when you see the price on the Kickstarter page, you'll think that uh, the amount of stuff you're getting is a steal at the low price we've got. But even within the same chapters, the tiles are randomized. You're not going to have the exact same locations. Minions will spawn in different spots, changing up your movement. The event deck will be different every game. And you tend to see only a fraction of the very large upgrade deck that you deck build with every game. So that's going to change things up quite a bit. But if you want to dig deeper and make even the tutorial chapter way tougher, you have a hard expert and impossible modes. You have an entire deck of challenge cards you can draw from that you unlock at the end of the campaign. Although technically you can just use them whenever you want. So yeah, you can make the game as tough or as uh, family friendly as you would like. And uh, really, you can play any of the chapters as one-offs and theoretically play them over and over again. And the next aspect of Flame and Fang I'd like to highlight is the deck building and the deck uh, permanent upgrading the campaign. And you know if you've watched any One Stop Co-op Shop stuff that we like a lot of deck builders. We've tried to pull in some of the things we enjoy the most from deck building into the game. So first, a big one is that when you get these upgrade cards, which can get incredibly powerful as you get into the more expensive ones, you replace the cards in your current deck with the new card. So as you take one card, you have to get rid of one card. And that means your deck stays the same size. You're never uh, bloating your deck to the point that you're not seeing your coolest cards frequently. Keeps things really tight and fun. It also gives you tough choices on like which uh, aspect, which suits of cards you want to focus on, which ones you might want to uh, cull out of existence for this particular play. But then to give you a bit more of that fun campaign feel, in addition to the deck upgrades you do within each chapter, you also get to permanently upgrade your deck at certain times during the campaign. Uh, you'll get to add cards permanently to your deck that are way stronger. You also get to unlock a permanent dragon powers that are always on and let you do cool tricks. Uh, you unlock other cool tools as the campaign goes along. I don't want to spoil too many of them, but basically uh, things are going to get more complex and more uh, tactically delicious as you play through. But just a lot of ways to make your dragon feel awesome to build powerful combos both within a chapter and within the campaign as a whole. We think it's a lot of fun and we hope you will too. For number three point, I'm sticking with the cards and here I'm looking at the aspect system, which uh, Peter was inspired by the game Key Forge, one of his favorites. So in your hand of usually six cards each round, you're going to have some from the fighting aspect, uh, dealing damage mostly, from the uh, hunting aspect, gathering resources to upgrade your deck, and from the flight aspect, mainly focus on movement. But you pick only a single aspect for the round, and except for special abilities and other uh, things you can do, those are the only cards you can play. It's almost like the other cards didn't exist in your hand. So that gives you tough choices on which aspect to choose. It might seem obvious you'll always choose the longest one, but definitely that is not the case when uh, you really need to attack based on like the board circumstances and what's going on. It also plays into, as I already mentioned, the deck building because sometimes you'll want to uh, get rid of one color entirely and just get these huge turns where you're playing like five or six cards all at once. And another cool element is the prep area. At the end of each round when you choose to pass, if you have cards left of the aspect you chose for that turn that you didn't want to play, you can prep one of them and these become basically like an extra free card that's permanently in your hand. It's like a seventh card or hey, if I prep two, it's like eight cards. So first of all, that means that I can <laughs> eventually have these crazy turns where I'm playing just a ton of cards because I've stored them up. But also, if you want to get more nuanced and tricky, you can use the prep area to sneakily uh, cull cards from your deck. Like, whoops, I guess I don't have any green cards anymore. Now it's red and blue and combat and movement forever. <laughs> so uh, the prep area and kind of the choice of aspects and how you deck build and what you do turn to turn, uh, we hope you'll find it really interesting. Oh, and a final fun note, uh, something we don't think we've ever seen another game do before, is that your life cards, which represent your uh, actual capacity to like suffer damage from enemies and survive, uh, they are also cards with aspects. And what happens is as they get damaged, they go in your discard pile 
and you have to draw them again and play them like any other card. That's how you heal, by picking that aspect and playing the life card. So when things get desperate, you can be like praying that the cards come back out and so that you can uh, play them back out and uh, survive. So yeah, just a lot of fun things we're trying to do with this uh, core aspect system in the game. The number two thing I'd like to highlight in Flame and Fang is the story deck and the narrative system in the game. This is something we've played around with in several of our designs, and we're really excited about it here. So we love adventure games. We love uh, things with a fun story in them here at the One Stop Co-op Shop. But we don't always want to read a ton. And again, we're trying to fit a ton of value in a small package with Flame and Fang. I, I think you're going to love the price again when you see it. So this story deck is like a little book you're just flipping through. Every uh, card is going to tell you how to flip to the next page. You'll always have a spread of these two cards. And it controls all the story in the game. You've got all your flavor text, what's happening to the dragons, who's trying to defeat them, and uh, how are you trying to survive. You've got all the setup for each chapter on another spread. You've got the only different rules you have to worry about. There's not a game where you're going to have to like look through three different campaign books and like 20 different cards to figure out what's going on. All the special rules you need for the chapter right here in this little spread of two cards. And then, you know, when you advance on, you'll get uh, maybe a boss spawning, some more flavor text, things like that. I won't spoil all of it. But yeah, each of the chapters is fully contained in this one little deck of cards. Uh, we hope the story is compelling for you. We certainly enjoy it. Yeah, something else we are very proud of in Flame and Fang. The story deck and how it kind of controls all the special rules, all the narrative, just keeps it all in one small package. And the final thing I want to highlight in Flame and Fang is the thing that I love most in games, and that's uh, the great tactical play and like kind of the puzzly combos you can put together. Now, for some of you, the narrative uh, point two might be your number one thing about the game, but this is what I love. So the actions in the game are very straightforward. You're picking up resources to grow, you're moving, you're attacking enemies where you find them. But there's a lot of tactical and strategic decisions in how you do that. So first of all, most cards have an extra action you can take on the bottom called a boost, but you can only activate that if you have a dragon stone, one of the resources you can gather from locations, or if you discard another card of your aspect for the turn from your hand. So you're kind of like paying the capacity for one action to do another one. And speaking of resources, besides letting you deck build as you gather them, they just open up lots of possibilities. Food can be discarded to let you draw more cards, have more options for things to play on your turn. Dragonstone, as I said, can be used to get extra actions out of your cards. And gold, well, that's one of, I think, the most interesting ones because that lets you treat cards that are not in your aspect as though they were for that turn. So suddenly you can uh, splash in some damage when normally you'd only be gathering or splash in some gathering when normally you'd only be moving. And not to spoil too much, but just to tease a little bit, things get even more complex and tactically enriching uh, when you get into the later chapters. You'll unlock these magic tokens that give you uh, free quote unquote actions when you need to kind of mitigate what you drew on your turn. But at the cost of adding condition cards, negative cards to your deck that might take up space in your hand, force you to pick a specific aspect unless you want to suffer some damage. Uh, steal your resources from you. There are lots of ways to deal with these, but they certainly uh, complicate your life a little bit. Then eventually you'll unlock other allies you can control and do things with. The turns are super quick. There's almost no downtime at all between dragons, but you can cooperate together, move in together, uh, attack minions together, leave resources for each other so you can uh, help each other grow and get stronger. It's a fairly streamlined game, but it's not lightweight. It is meaty if you want it to be, especially again if you up the uh, ante with the harder difficulty modes. So yeah, we hope that you find the tactical picture in Flame and Fang just a ton of fun. Thanks for watching, everybody. We're so excited about Flame and Fang, and we hope you're excited too. And again, feel free to check out the BGG page, subscribe to the Kickstarter, and in October, we'll see if uh, this dragon can take flight. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you at the next stop.